My name is Leslie Moisey and I am an assistant professor at the University of Saskatchewan and a registered dietitian with six years of experience working in an acute care hospital. My research interests include examining the role nutrition plays in enhancing recovery from critical illness as well as developing novel and integrative nutrition and rehabilitative interventions to improve patient outcomes in this population. Today, I am here to talk to you about nutrition recovery in the critically ill as it relates to our current understanding of how patients recover and to provide strategies on how you can help to enhance the recovery of critically ill patients in your hospital as they transition from the intensive care unit. By the end of this presentation, you will be able to identify the three core health-related morbidities frequently experienced in survivors of critical illness, state three barriers to consuming adequate nutrition faced by patients recovering from critical illness, and identify three strategies that can be implemented by members of the multidisciplinary healthcare team to enhance nutrition recovery in survivors of critical illness. I have received lecture honoraria from Nestle Health Science. I'd like to begin by reviewing the common trajectory of illness for the severely ill, critically ill patient as is illustrated here. In Canada, greater than 80% of patients requiring an ICU admission will survive to hospital discharge, and my presentation today focuses on patients in the early stages of ward-based recovery, specifically after they have been liberated from mechanical ventilation and transitioned from the ICU to a hospital ward. Unfortunately, survivorship is not indicative of quality of life, and in fact, many survivors of critical illness may experience post-intensive care syndrome, which refers to a constellation of health-related morbidities across three broad domains. The first domain is functional disability, secondary to in-ICU muscle loss and ICU-acquired weaknesses. Patients may also experience cognitive impairments such as delirium, memory loss, and deficits in executive functioning. Lastly, many patients suffer from perturbations in mental health, including depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder following an ICU stay. The strongest risk factors for the development of post-intensive care syndrome are prolonged mechanical ventilation, sepsis, and multi-organ failure, and features of this syndrome can be observed as early as while the patient remains in the ICU and may persist for several years following hospital discharge. Not surprisingly, this has been associated with reduced quality of life in survivorship. Thus, it is clear the recovering critically ill are a unique patient population, and while much work has been devoted to developing strategies and interventions to enhance recovery, the role that nutrition plays in this process is unclear, and to date, little attention has been given to this area of research. However, it is crucial attention be given to the nutritional state of those surviving critical illness. While the prevalence of malnutrition at the time of ICU discharge has not been measured, it is probable that most patients will have a degree of malnutrition related to disease processes. As illustrated here, the onset of acute illness triggers an acute inflammatory response and pronounced stress metabolism, resulting in increased catabolism, insulin resistance, and anabolic resistance. Throughout the duration of mechanical ventilation, patients typically receive inadequate protein and calories, and in the stressed state, tissues are less sensitive to anabolic stimuli such as amino acids, thus nutrient uptake is impaired. Throughout ICU admission, patients are often immobilized, which is associated with muscle wasting and dysfunction, and they may also receive medications that increase muscle protein breakdown. Each of these factors independently contribute to a metabolic state that favors the loss of lean body mass and decreased functional capacity, which are established indicators of malnutrition. Thus, at the time of liberation from mechanical ventilation, patients are likely to have developed disease-related malnutrition with the level of severity influenced by factors including pre-morbid health status, severity of illness, duration of mechanical ventilation, and length of ICU stay. Malnutrition is a state that results in considerable adverse effects on every organ system, as shown here, and can lead to alterations in body composition, diminished physical and mental functioning, 
and impaired clinical outcomes from disease. Thus, given that malnourished patients experience comorbidities across the three same health domains observed in post-intensive care syndrome, it is essential the nutritional health of patients over the trajectory of critical illness is addressed. To date, only two studies have examined nutrition intake in medical surgical ICU patients following liberation from mechanical ventilation. In the first seven days following liberation from mechanical ventilation, you can see here that patients prescribed oral diets as sole source nutrition had substantially poor intake, consuming only one third of prescribed protein and half of prescribed calories. Interestingly, when we examined intake in patients who continued to receive enteral nutrition therapy, we observed patients received greater than 75% of prescribed protein and calories, which provides a signal to suggest that delaying the discontinuation of enteral nutrition following liberation from mechanical ventilation may help to improve adequacy of nutrition intake. Upon review of the few studies examining barriers to oral intake specifically in critically ill patients, it has become clear that the predominant barriers to eating relate to the physiological effects of illness, none of which are easily modified, thus underscoring the challenges that healthcare providers face in optimizing the nutrition care of these vulnerable patients. Nutrition recovery has also been found to be negatively impacted by poor transitional care, which is defined as the care provided before, during, and after the transfer of an ICU patient to another unit to ensure minimal disruption and optimal continuity of care. For example, as a patient transitions from the ICU, it has been found that nutrition care plans are not documented or provided to ward staff. Furthermore, once the patient is on the ward, interventions impacting nutrition care are often enacted prior to the patient receiving a formal dietitian assessment. Finally, it has also been observed that ward cultures in which goals of cares are centered on removing tubes, catheters, and so forth also negatively impact nutrition care. It is also essential to recognize the vulnerability of the recovering critically ill patient. Using qualitative research methods, Dr. Merriweather and colleagues from the United Kingdom have found that recovering critically ill patients report changes to their body and identities as factors negatively impacting their ability to eat, as were changes in their routines, food habits, and feelings of isolation related to their hospital admission. Thus, it is clear patients face many challenges to consuming adequate nutrition following a stay in the ICU. Fortunately, there are strategies that can be implemented by all members of the multidisciplinary healthcare team that can be employed to enhance nutrition care in survivors. The first and arguably most important component to achieving this goal is to recognize the recovering critically ill are a unique subset of patients that are different to a typical medical or surgical patient and are likely already malnourished upon transfer to the ward for reasons I've previously discussed. Next, it is essential that detailed nutrition care plans are communicated to ward staff when patients are transferred from the ICU, and dietitians are also notified of these transfers so the patient can be assessed as appropriate. Once on the ward, changes to nutrition care plans should be enacted after a formal nutrition assessment, and issues, including those of a physiological, functional, and psychological nature, that impact nutrition care must be identified. It is also instrumental that a patient's nutrition care plan be monitored and adjusted as appropriate, and their nutrition progress is made a part of regular discussions within the multidisciplinary care team. Within your facility, a strategy to help implement such changes may include the development of institutional-specific transition of care pathways and checklists. Lastly, there are several potential nutrition-specific interventions that can be employed to improve the nutrition care of the recovering critically ill patient. However, it is also important to recognize that there are considerable knowledge gaps in this area of study, thus emphasizing the importance of engaging in future research. First, more research is required to guide practice with respect to how much and what we feed patients in the recovery phase of illness. For some patients, aggressive or prolonged use of enteral nutrition may be an effective strategy to enhance nutrition intake. However, 
the efficacy, safety, and acceptability of continuing enteral feeding beyond the ICU must be taken into consideration. Finally, despite the physiological barriers that appear to negatively impact dietary intake, continued testing of food-focused strategies, such as fortifying foods, and interventions that focus on increasing intake, such as use of oral nutrition supplements, with an emphasis on protein, are essential. This concludes my presentation. You should now be able to identify the health-related morbidities often experienced by ICU survivors, and understand that following liberation from mechanical ventilation, patients have poor nutrition intake that is due to a multitude of physiological, environmental, and institutional barriers. However, you should now also be able to identify multidisciplinary and patient-centered strategies that you can employ within your own institutions to improve the nutrition care of the recovering critically ill patient. Thank you.